Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. And it came about when she was in severe labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. And it came about, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him ben Benohi. His father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Okay. So she died giving birth to Benjamin. Okay, and then Rachel, and then she had a son and named him Ben-Oni, and then the father Israel, Israel, called him Ben-Jamin. Wonderful things that are hidden in the Bible, Benjamin. Okay, or we'll say it in Hebrew, Ben-Yamin, okay, Ben-Yamin, Ben-Oni. Okay, so what do you see there? Anything? Well, I was reading this one day and it just it just popped right into my head. Unbelievable. Anything? Anybody? They're in Bethel and they're going to Bethlehem. On the way to Bethlehem. Okay. Both advents of Jesus Christ are in this one paragraph. Bethel is the house of God. Okay? House of God. All right. Here's the house, Beit Lechem, the house of bread, also known as Ephrath, which means fruit. Okay. Rachel is a lamb. Okay. And then we have Benoni, son of my suffering. And then we have Benjamin, son of my right hand. Okay, here we go. Jesus Christ left heaven, the house of God. It says it right in the New Testament. He left his dom domain and he came to walk among us, right? And he, where was he born? Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. He said, I am the bread of life. All right, that's why he was born in Bethlehem. All right, we're the fruit. If you... Uh, abide in me, you will bear much fruit, right? Okay? So, here we have, where he's fulfilling the mission of the Father. He's the bread of life. He's bringing about fruit on the earth, okay? In his, he's also the Lamb of God, okay? Right? Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, this is feminine here, but he's the Lamb of God. If that's his mother who is a lamb, then he is a lamb from his mother because they produce after their own kind, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay? He's the Lamb of God, the Amnos in Greek, all right, which is the sacrificial lamb. Okay? She says, this is the son of my suffering. What does Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 53, 12 point to? The suffering servant. And throughout the entire New Testament, he's called the suffering servant in one form or another. Maybe not directly, but he is, that was his mission, was to come and to suffer on our behalf. Benoni. But Israel, he struggles with God or Prince of God, changed his name to Ben-Yamin, son of my right hand. What does it say in Mark 16? We'll go there real quickly here. It says it again several times in the Bible. But Mark 16, he, he suffered on our behalf. And it says, Mark 16, hang on one sec here. Brand new Bible. Hard to get through these pages, sorry. Um, uh, it says here, says it a couple times, says it in Acts, it says it elsewhere. But it says here, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand. right hand of God. There you go. And he's coming again to rule the nations as the conquering king. One paragraph. And you wonder, why is this teeny little story in the Bible? Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. We just have to determine what is it in there for. It's not just a cute story to say, oh, this poor lady died while she was giving birth. It was recorded for a reason because other people died giving birth and they're not recorded. But isn't that amazing? The entire work of Christ is pointed to in one paragraph of the Bible. I Fantastic. One question. Yes. What, how do we, why are we referring to Rachel as the lamb? That's what Rachel means. Rachel oh. is a lamb. 
Well, if she's a lamb, then that means he is the son of a lamb. A picture of him being the sacrificial, the omnos, the sacrificial lamb of God. Okay, which if you go to Isaiah 15, uh, Isaiah uh, 52, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, let's see here. Isaiah 52, and then it says here, Behold, my servant shall... I'm not going to read the whole thing because I'm going to do that next Sunday. But uh, he's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and um, surely he has borne our griefs, and we uh, carried our sorrows. He's a stricken. And then it says here, oh, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, uh, iniquity of us all. And then it says, He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Okay, in the Greek translation of New Testament, the word amnos is used, which is the same word that John, when he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the amnos, okay? So, he was, uh, uh, she before her shearers the silence, so he opened not his, uh, his mouth, and blah, 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 it goes on down there. He'll see the suffering of his soul, and he shall uh, uh, prolong his days. And so, the whole thing is pointing right there. That's why that story is in the Bible, is to give us something to peer into and to say, look at the marvelous work that God is promising will come. Even though nobody had any idea about it. I was just reading the Bible for the four millionth time and I saw that and I thought, you know, why is this in here? Sit there and think it through. That's why it's in there. The whole thing is in there for a reason. So, anyway, we're done with the Bible. Let's go home. No. Oh, no. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, well, you know, yeah, but... But that's, but that's what you want to do, is you want to, as you're reading, and I, am I going to say this? I'm going to say this next Sunday night, not next Sunday morning, so I'll say it now. Um, yeah, when you read the Bible, always ask, how does this point to Jesus? All right, I'm not going to say that on the Sunday morning service, so. Okay, um, uh, and just so you know, anybody that doesn't know, I get to preach here next Sunday morning, great. And then anybody that wants to come out to the beach next Sunday afternoon, it'll be on Christology at the beach, so, which is the study or doctrine of Christ. So it'll be kind of like last night's. It'll be more doctrine rather than a flowery sermon. But uh, anyway, it's my favorite subject in the entire Bible is Christology. Um, do you know that while we're taking a quick break here, do we know what the biblical disciplines are? There's about 10 of them. I don't remember all of them right offhand, but you have, um, you have Bibliology, Okay, which is, uh, obviously you know what bibliology is, right? Study of the Bible, the doctrine of the Bible. And then you have hamar theology. Okay, hamar chion is um, uh, sin, the study of sin. What? What? Hamar theology. I'm just, you don't need to write these down. I'm just, you can if you want. But hamar theology, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y. That's the, the doctrine of sin. And then you have Christology. Obviously, you know what that is, Christology. All right, study of Christ. You have um, uh, pneumatology, P-N-E-U, pneumatology, which is the study of pneumos, the Holy Spirit. Thank you. All right. And then you have, um, uh, why can't I remember these? I'm, I've been going through them. Uh, uh, Christology, um, hang on one second. Pneumatology. Um, oh, angelology. That's pretty easy. Angelology. And then you also have, which is kind of combined with demonology. Tough one there. And um, then we also have ecclesiology. Ecclesiology. Ology. What is that? Study of the church. Study of the church. Very good. The ecclesiastical. Okay, the study of the church. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll get all of them for you. I'll try to remember them. But there's, there's ten major disciplines. And so, as long as, you don't need to know these big words, but as long as you know what the disciplines are, when you're reading the Bible, it helps you to look at the Bible and study it from this perspective. Oh, this has to do with demons, and therefore, I can apply it in demonology, okay? And most people just read it, and they say, well, there's a demon, and he did something, and they don't think, why is this in here? But if you actually look at it as a whole, it really helps you understand the Bible. But in the end, the main one that I, I recommend, if you don't study any other, is this one right here. How does the Bible point to this? Because it always does. It always points to Jesus Christ from the first sentence of the Bible, literally. And the ones that were here for Genesis 1-1, we spent three hours on Genesis 1-1. And a lot of it is just about Jesus. Anyway, so there you go. Um, and I, I, the one below 
This one? Oh, pneumatology, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. Actually, they don't pronounce the P, but I'm trying to give it to you. And that's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So, And there are others. I'm forgetting them right now. Maybe I'll remember them as we're talking. Doxology. No, doxology is an outburst of praise. You know, Paul is writing, and all of a sudden he says um, uh, something like, um, oh, the unsurpassing greatness of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. That's a doxology. He just suddenly comes, oh, He's, he's just writing and he just freaks out with joy and starts writing a doxology. That's a doxology. Um, uh, okay, so we are in 21 now. Please, go ahead. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. Okay, Migdal Eder. It's only mentioned two times in the Bible, I believe. And I think, I think... It's in Zephaniah, where the other one is mentioned. So let me go there real quickly. And um, the Tower of Eder, which is Migdal Eder. And um, let me see if I can find it here. It's, O oh, Watchtower of the Flock. Is that in Zephaniah? Um, oh, hang on one sec here. Um, the pure language. I think it's in... Oh, I know. I can check my Strong's Concordance. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's not it. Uh, I can check the Strong... If I don't find it real quickly in Zephaniah... Um, just so you know this, where it's at and why it's in here, why it mentions Migdal Eder. And I do believe it's in Zephaniah, but I'm not going to spend all day on it. So let me pull this out and uh, hang on here. E-D-E-R. It's actually, let's see here, E-D-E-R. And it may be termed Migdal in this E-D-E-R, E-D. Okay. Eder, Jagger, see also Edar, all right, yeah, E-D-A-R is how they have it here. So, uh, Genesis Tower of Adar, all right. All right, well then let me go to Migdal and see if they have it that way in here, and if not, we may be, it is mentioned one more time, and Mig, Migdal. I know I got that word right in my head. Hang on one second here. Migdal. M I D M I M I thank you. I'm, brain isn't working. M I N M I G uh Migdal. Migdal L, Migdal Gad, Migdal Egypt and published in Migdal pitch between Migdal and the sea. Um Oh, tower. Okay, watch tower. Maybe it's watch tower or tower of the tower flock. Of the flock. Yes. Where is that? Well, I'm not sure. It's just in my it's a little helps here. Okay. Well, that's it what. It refers to uh, a couple different. Some in Micah. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. Micah, not. I'm not looking. All right, let me see here. That's what I'm looking for, and I, you might be right. Mika, 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 not Malachi. I'm looking for Mika. Um, and unfortunately, once again, it's taking me forever because it's new Bible, and I don't have anything in here. So, um, But someday this Bible will be old and used, so whatever. One thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Amos, Obadiah. Help me out here, Charlie. Micah 4, 8. Is that what you said? Yeah, well, it gives... Or ah, that's it. That's the one we want right there. Okay, it says, um, and you, O tower of the flock, which is the same term as we just saw, Migdal Eder, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. And so what they believe here, uh, it, it, this is not in the New Testament, so it's just speculation, but Migdal Eder is the place where the sacrificial lambs were kept for the time of the temple when Jesus was alive. And they believe, some people have postulated that he was actually born, you know, it says he was born in uh, what a, uh, a, they say uh, like a cave or like an inn. Uh, um, what is it? It's in Luke. It says there's no room in the inn, so they put him in a stable. Well, they, it's actually more a cave in the side of a building, but that is where the sacrificial lambs were kept. And so that's a picture of where he being born in the place that he would actually fulfill 
the, the, the picture of that, which is Migdal Adair, the watchtower of the flock. The flock is kept there, and this is where Jacob is right now. Do you see that? Does everybody see that, what I'm talking about? Is that when Jesus was born, he was born to die as the Lamb of God. 